as written. Members, a leave of absence is uh, requested and without objection is granted for Senator Woodard. Senator Hannig, for what purpose you rise? Uh, point of personal privilege, out of order. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Today I have two senatorial statements that I had the honor to read. The first one is a senatorial statement celebrating Chowan University's 175th anniversary. Whereas Chowan University is a Christian educational institution that was founded in 1848, making this year, this, this year the university's 175th anniversary. And whereas Chowan means people of the South and honors the Native American Algonquin Ch Chowanoke tribe, and whereas in the spring of 1848, a group of fathers met at the home of Dr. Godwin Cotton Moore, moderator of the Chowan Baptist Association, to support the establishment of an institution that would give their daughters a well-rounded education. The association approved a resolution establishing the school and appointed the first trustees for the female high school to be called Chowan Female Institute. Dr. Archibald McDowell of South Carolina was elected the first principal and the, op the institution opened on October 11th, 1848 with 11 students. And whereas today, Chowan has over 15,000 alumni who live around the world, Chowan alumni, friends, students, families, faculty, and staff are held in high regard. These alumni are transforming the world by solving problems, sharing talents, and spreading Chowan's rich history and now, therefore, it is fitting and proper to honor Chowan University on its demi semi septennial and to commemorate the institution, honor its heritage, and applaud the people who had the vision to establish this university. Mr. President, I humbly ask that this statement be spread across the journal. Upon the motion of Senator Bobby Hannig of Currituck County, the chair is happy to extend courtesies of the gallery to uh, Charles Taylor. Uh, Mr. Taylor is president of Chowan University, Kemper Blair, chair of the board of trustees, Ray Felton, a trustee, Burton Wilson, a trustee, Betty Jo Shepard, a trustee elect. Uh, along with them are James Moore, uh, who is on the board of visitors and is a direct descendant of Dr. Godwin Cotton Moore. Uh, and uh, John Taylor, who's the executive assistant to the president, and Trey Lewis, who is the Northeast North Carolina Regional Director uh, for the office of Senator Tom Tillis. If you're in the gallery with us today, uh, if you'd please stand to be recognized. Thank you for being with us. And Senator Hannig, uh, you have the floor for a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. First, I have a question for the rules chairman. Uh, Senator Rabin, do you yield? I yield. He yields. Thank you, Senator Rabin. Uh, the, the question I'm asking is uh, it's regarding the ox meter. Um, I know I'm going to be up here for a while, but there are two separate issues, and I didn't know if there was any consideration as far as how much time I sp spend standing, if that uh, gives me reprieve from the ox meter. Mr. President. Uh, Senator Raven, you may answer that. I've uh, never I, had someone it, volunteer for the ox meter before. Yeah, I'm not it, volunteering. It depends entirely on how fast you can read. I can read pretty fast. Uh, Senator Handy, you have the floor. Thank you, Senator. The next senatorial statement I have is honoring the life and memory of Edwin Goodhouse. Um, I don't believe that this resolution really catches what he meant to Currituck County um, and his love for Currituck County, North Carolina, and United States of America. Um, honoring the life and memory of Edwin, Good, Edwin Woodhouse, whereas Edwin Ed Woodhouse was born on February 1st, 1936 in Mount Airy, North Carolina, to Wilbur and Eunice Woodhouse. He grew up in Currituck County and received his education from Lewisburg College and Pfeiffer College, and he also went to W.T. Griggs Elementary School. Whereas Ed Woodhouse became one of the state's most effective lobbyists working for the North Carolina Bottlers Association and North Carolina Poultry Federation, of which he served as the body's first executive director, and 
whereas Ed Woodhouse successfully ran the campaign to elect Dan K. Moore as governor of the state and later became executive director of the North Carolina Democratic Party. And whereas Ed Woodhouse gave freely of his time to many organizations, including Keep North Carolina Clean and Beautiful, North Carolina Agribusiness Council, North Carolina Business and Industry, and North Carolina Free Enterprise Foundation all of which he served in leadership roles. He was appointed by the General Assembly to be a board member of the first in flight. And whereas Ed Woodhouse was a man of great faith who helped those in need and was a board member of the Carolina Bible Camp, Christians in Action, and a leader in Raleigh's Brooks Avenue Church of Christ. And whereas Ed Woodhouse was a fan of the North Carolina State University Wolfpack and regularly attended basketball and football games. And where Ed Woodhouse died on August 2nd, 2023 at the age of 87. Now therefore it is fitting and proper to honor the life and memory of Ed Woodhouse, one of the state's most distinguished citizens and to extend sympathy to his family and for the loss of a family member. Mr. President, I commend this resolution to you and ask that it be spread across the journal. And upon the motion of Senator Bobby Hannig of Currituck County, Chair is happy to extend courtesies of the gallery to Betty Ann Woodhouse, uh, the widow of Ed Woodhouse, uh, and Anna Summers, uh, his daughter, and Eddie Woodhouse, his son. If you are in the gallery with us today, please stand. Uh, thank you for being with us today. And I believe we are ready to go to our calendar unless there are other items. Senator Raven, for what purpose you rise? A few motions, please, Mr. President. State your motions. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, first, move that all bills from the Senate today be sent to the House and to the Governor by special message. That objection, so ordered. Uh, further move that House Bill 5, local changes, omnibus, be removed from today's calendar and placed on Thursday's calendar. So ordered. Uh, further move, uh, Senate Joint Resolution 755, confirm Quentin McGee, Special Superior Court Judge, which was heard in judiciary this morning and reported favorably, uh, be uh, moved that that resolution be added to today's full calendar for immediate consideration. That objection. So ordered. Senate Joint Resolution 755, the clerk will read. Senate Joint Resolution 755 confirm Quentin McGee, Special Supreme Court Judge. Uh, Senator Raven, I think he just got promoted, but um, <laughs> you, are, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I rise today to uh, ask for your support in the confirmation of uh, Quentin McGee. Uh, I know Mr. McGee personally. He has served uh, in uh, my county and in my district and is now a resident uh, in my county. Uh, and I want to say uh, again today, because I want to be very clear, I don't get up every day uh, looking forward to saying nice things about lawyers and judges. It, it's not part of my psychic or what I do. But I did get up today. Uh, ready and happy to say nice things about Quentin McGee. He is a wonderful man. He's a good father. He has a brain, he has a heart, and he has fortitude. And he knows how to use them all. Uh, he has been a member of my community for some time, uh, quite respected, has worked hard, has gained the respect of uh, the lawyers of the district attorneys and of the, uh, the bar, the local bar. He has been a judge, he has been a defender, and he has been a prosecutor, and he has practiced law. We don't generally see that uh, in our nominees. Uh, and I, I wonder, and I said, when, when his name came forward, how on earth did this happen? Uh, this is the type of person, this is the trifecta, uh, this is the type of person that we should want in this job. And I'll say this about him, that uh, members of this uh, chamber who do not know him uh, should know 
Uh, it's going to hurt some folks back home, but uh, when he was a district court judge, he was the hardest working district court judge that we had. Uh, he didn't leave his office until the docket was complete, and uh, people respected him for that. They weren't always happy to be there, uh, but he saw the job complete, and I have every assurance and every bit of confidence uh, going forward that he will do the same as he travels across the entire state um, to be a special superior court judge. I would encourage you to uh, support this uh, and uh, move forward today. Thank you. Further discussion or debate? Hearing none, question for the Senate is the adoption of Senate Joint Resolution 755 on its second reading. All in favor will vote aye. All opposed will vote no. Five seconds be allowed for the voting clerk to record the vote. Forty-nine having voted in the affirmative, none in the negative. Senate Joint Resolution 755 has passed its second reading and will, without objection, be read a third time. The General Assembly of North Carolina enacts. Discussion or debate on third reading. Hearing none, question for the Senate is a passage on third reading of Senate Joint Resolution 755. All in favor will say aye. aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it. And Senate Joint Resolution 755 has passed its third reading and will be sent to the House. Local bill for concurrence, Senate Bill 68. The clerk will read. Senate Bill 68, various local changes. Uh, members, hold on just a moment. Um, judge, I apologize. Uh, upon the motion of Senator Bill Rabin and Senator Danny Britt of Brunswick and Robeson County, Chair is happy to extend courtesies to Superior Court Judge nominee Quentin McGee, uh, who is in the gallery. Judge, thank you for being with us today. to uh, the um, motion to concur in Senate Bill 68, Senator Moffitt is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, the motion before us is to cur concur with the House Committee substitute for Senate Bill uh, 68. Uh, and I must admit, sadly, that after 10 months, I have come to realize that everything that returns to us from the House is not perfect and in order. So I would ask that we vote no on the motion to concur so we can perfect this in conference. Thank you. Discussion or debate? Hearing none, question for the Senate is the motion to concur in the House Committee substitute Senate Bill 68. All in favor of the motion would vote aye. All opposed vote no. The bill sponsor asks that you vote no. Five seconds be allowed for the voting clerk to record the vote. None having voted in the affirmative, 49 in the negative. Uh, the uh, House committee substitute is not concurred in and the House will be so notified. Public bill for concurrence, Senate Bill 677. The clerk will read. Senate Bill 677, surveyor's right of entry expedite commercial building. Senator Jarvis is recognized to explain the motion. Thank you, Mr. President. Senate Bill 677 is a bill that we passed unanimously out of this House in May. Uh, the House added language in Section 2 that addresses uh, regulations for commercial and multifamily development projects. It addresses a pre-submittal meeting, outlines a timeline for plan review, and gives an option of utilizing independent third-party plan reviewers. Additionally, it outlines available at-risk building permit options. I have met with all stakeholders. We have 14 different agencies and associations in support of this bill, and I would ask that you concur with this bill. Discussion? Discussion or debate?
Hearing on the question for the Senate is the motion to concur in the House Committee substitute Senate Bill 677. All in favor of the motion will vote aye. All opposed vote no. Five seconds to be allowed for the voting clerk. Record the vote. Thirty having voted in the affirmative, nineteen in the negative. The uh, motion to concur uh, is adopted, and the House will be. I'm sorry, and the bill will be enrolled and sent to the governor. Reconsideration of vetoed bill, Senate Bill 512. The clerk will read. Senate Bill 512, greater accountability for boards, commissions. Senator Daniel is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, members, we've had a lengthy floor debate on this bill on more than one occasion. So I won't belabor the debate by going into great detail on Senate Bill 512. But Senate Bill 512 is about good shared governance and bringing balance and accountability to unelected boards. Right now, the governor appoints more uh, members to more than 350 boards. All of these boards have significant impacts on people's lives. They make rules and regulations that North Carolinians must abide by. Our bill seeks to make changes to 12 of these boards. And it does so by expanding the appointment authorities beyond one office holder. It does not make sense for these boards to be made up of appointments from one individual. The executive branch in North Carolina is made up of 10 offices that cover a variety of governance. The General Assembly, the legislative branch is closest to the citizens of North Carolina, we're elected every two years. We have 170 members coming from every corner of the state. By giving the General Assembly and the other members of the executive branch more appointment power, we are expanding the pool of candidates and bringing more diversity of thought to certain boards. This bill will not interrupt any work of the boards and commissions, as the governor claimed in his veto message. Hundreds of appointments are made to these boards and commissions annually, and this bill does not disrupt that process. Senate Bill 512 will make improvements to the appointment process by bringing more balance and better representation to these boards and commissions. It will bring more accountability by having gen the General Assembly uh, appointments voted on by all 170 members, not just handpicked by one individual. So I urge you all to override this veto and bring balance and accountability to these unelected boards. So Mr. President, I move that Senate Bill 512, greater accountability for boards and commissions, become law notwithstanding the objections of the governor. Discussion or debate? Senator Mayfield, for what purpose you rise? To speak to the motion. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, it, it is true that we have had lots of debate about this bill, um, but I'm going to ask your indulgence on just a little bit more. As I have said previously, I believe this bill represents an unconstitutional step away from our democratic system of government and toward an authoritarian one. It represents a dilution of the sacred separation of powers and a concentration of additional power in this body. We should be concerned about both of those things, and if the Democrats were in power and making these moves, you would be crying foul, just as we are. I also have specific concerns with some of these changes, like reducing the geographic representation on the NCDOT board and reducing the number of people who will be shouldering the, very, the new and very complex work at the Utilities Commission. But I am mostly struck by the name of this bill, an act to increase the accountability of public boards and commissions to the citizens of North Carolina by changing the appointment structure of those boards and commissions. I find this ironic because the definition of, account of accountable is <clears throat> a person, organization, or institution that is required or expected to justify actions or decisions. Second definition is responsible. I would argue that grounding appointments in the General Assembly is the opposite of increasing the accountability of those appointments and of those boards and commissions to the citizens of North Carolina. Indeed, the General Assembly might be the most unaccountable branch of government at this point in our state, given how secure most of our seats are, how few of us have primaries, and how even fewer of us have any meaningful challengers in general elections. Indeed, it is this lack of accountability that has allowed so many things to happen in this session. A budget that was almost three months late, 
taking step backwards on gun control and failing to take any meaningful steps forward to protect innocent people from gun violence, despite the overwhelming majority of people and gun owners wanting sensible gun regulations. Imposing an abortion ban and making it harder for women to access legal abortions when a majority of people want access to abortion to remain legal, available, and safe. Failing to provide adequate raises to teachers and other state workers to help reduce the overwhelming vacancy rate in Mr. state President. agencies. Senator Daniel, for what purpose you rise? Point of order. Uh, state your point. Mr. President, I believe that this bill has nothing to do with the state budget, with gun laws, with pro-life laws in the state of North Carolina, and would ask that the speaker speak to Senate Bill 512. Uh, Senator Daniel, uh, I will um, uh, make the same ad admonition to um, uh, Senator Mayfield and to all speakers uh, to uh, speak to the motion, uh, but I am not going to micromanage exactly how you do so. Senator Mayfield, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, as I was saying, failing to provide adequate raises to teachers and other state workers to help reduce the overwhelming vacancy rate in state agencies and improve service to the public, making legislative records private and putting them up for sale to the highest bidder without any public discussion or vetting or even an explanation of how this provision got into the budget, creating a civil investigative force that can undertake secret investigations also without any public discussion or vetting. And we are anticipating electoral maps that are even more heavily gerrymandered than the current ones, though the overwhelming call from the public has been for fair, non-gerrymandered maps drawn by an independent, nonpartisan commission. This legislature is the definition of unaccountable, which is a person, organization, or institution that is not required or expected to justify its actions or decisions, not responsible for results or consequences. A second definition, unable to be explained. The governor at least stands alone in an election and must answer to the voters for a whole set of decisions that he, his agencies, and the boards and commissions populated by his appointees have made. With the appointments shared so broadly between the executive and legislative branches, how can the public know who to hold accountable for these decisions going forward? And even if the public is able to determine the legislative appointees are causing mischief, is it, it is virtually impossible to hold us accountable as a body. Indeed, it's virtually impossible to hold, hold us accountable as individuals, given how safe most of our districts are. To quote Governor Cooper, fundamentally, this bill violates the separation of powers enshrined in the state constitution. The courts have consistently rejected these legislative power grabs in McCrory versus Berger and other cases. Legislative efforts to seize executive power are unconstitutional and damage vital state work. I agree, and I ask you to vote to sustain the governor's veto. Further discussion or debate? Hearing none, motion before the body is that Senate Bill 512 become law notwithstanding the objections of the governor. All in favor of the motion will vote aye. All opposed, vote no. Five seconds be allowed for the voting. Clerk, record the vote. Senator Sanderson, aye. Senator Waddell, no. Senator Muhammad, no. 30 having voted uh, in the affirmative and 19 in the negative. Motion to override the governor's veto of Senate Bill 512 passes by three-fifths of the members present and voting. In accordance with Article 2, Section 22, Paren 1 of the Constitution of North Carolina, Senate Bill 512, together with the governor's objections and veto message, will be sent to the House by special message for reconsideration. Senate Bill 678, the clerk will read. Senate Bill 678, clean energy, other changes. Senator Paul Newton is recognized to explain the motion. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, higher electric rates disproportionately hurt low-income families 
because they spend a larger portion of their income on energy than other households. Despite the fact that we enjoy electric rates in North Carolina that are well below the national average, the poorest families in North Carolina already pay more than 20% of their household income just for electricity. The clean energy sections of Senate Bill 678 that the governor rejected will help us reach our energy goals cost effectively, more cost effectively, and ensure North Carolinians can afford this basic human need of electricity as we move towards a cleaner energy future. I submit that if you want to meet the ambitious carbon reduction goals in House Bill 951 as cost effectively as possible, if you care about the cost burden and minimizing the cost burden of the clean energy transition on the poor, you will vote in favor of this motion. And therefore, Mr. President, I move that Senate Bill 678, clean energy, other changes become law, notwithstanding the objection of the governor. Thank you. Discussion, <clears throat> discussion or debate? Senator Meyer, for what purpose you rise? Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to debate the motion. You have the floor. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I urge you to sustain the governor's veto. And frankly, I'm surprised to hear Senator Newton's emphasis on concerns about bottom line costs, because one of the main reasons to sustain the veto on this bill is that in the conference report, the conferees decided to strike 32 very important words that were previously on page 8 of the conference report that, that, and by doing so, substantially weaken North Carolina's current rigorous requirements for cost effectiveness tests for any new power plants. That means that our cost of electricity is likely going to go up. For many years, the General Assembly in this current statute has required utilities to demonstrate and the Utilities Commission to evaluate first if energy efficiency measures, demand side management, renewable energy resource generation, combined heat and power generation, or any combination thereof would establish or maintain a more cost effective and reliable generation system before granting a permit to a proposed new power plant. This is very important, especially when we're considering energy efficiency which is actually the best way to bring down costs for anyone. But unfortunately, this language is deleted in the final conference report. Further, uh, as Senator Mayfield and I stated when we debated this previously, I'm disappointed that the conferees decided to remove a provision that would have increased North Carolina's cap on solar leasing. North Carolina is the only state in the nation that still caps how many, solar, how many utility customers can install solar projects in their homes or businesses via a leasing financing structure. I hope that we can fix this unnecessary problem in a bill soon because I cannot think of any cheaper way to generate power than having energy that literally comes out of the sky for free. And finally, I do not believe that this major change to North Carolina's construction permitting process for new power plants has been debated adequately, did not appear in earlier versions of Senate Bill 678. And, when we, and as we do try to reach the carbon reduction goals that we set in House Bill 951, there will be the need to take on major new discussions about the ways that we undertake any type of evolving power, including nuclear power. But we need a clear regulatory framework, and this bill takes us backwards. I encourage you to vote no on the motion. Further discussion or debate? Senator Newton, <coughs> what purpose you rise? Thank you, Mr. President, to speak on the motion. You have the floor. Yeah, I'm happy to report to you that the senator uh, from the other side of the aisle could not be more wrong about the effect of the provision. The original provision that he's discussed with you only required nuclear and coal to judge itself against DSM, demand side management, and energy efficiency. Eliminating that provision simply means we're doing the right thing. Every single next increment of generation has to clear the hurdle of demand side management and energy efficiency. Not just coal, not just nuclear, but any form of the next increment of generation. This creates a level playing field for everybody. 
and the Commission will look at DSM and EE as alternatives to that next increment of generation regardless of what is being proposed. So that's good news for you. You can rest easy. E DSM and EE will be judged against every single new element of uh, increment of generation as the bill has been rewritten. Secondly, with respect to solar leasing uh, cap, the senator makes the assertion that it's the cheapest. There can't be anything cheaper than solar. And I say if that's true, the Utilities Commission will decide that. One of the fundamental tenets of 951 is that we, the legislature, are in a less appropriate position to choose the next increment of generation than our expert Utilities Commission, all of whom, by the way, as we sit here at this moment, are appointed by the governor. They will decide what the cheapest is, the cheapest way to decarbonize, the cheapest way to, to support the demand of our growing state, not this legislature. So I commend the overriding the motion, or commend the motion to you, overriding the veto, and I, I can tell you that the concerns that have been uh, addressed uh, or, or have been raised actually are not concerns at all as to the quality and the effectiveness of this, uh, this bill. So I commend it to you. Further discussion or debate? Hearing none, the motion before the Senate is that Senate Bill 678 become law notwithstanding the objections of the governor. All in favor will vote aye, all opposed will vote no. Five seconds will be allowed for the voting. Clerk will record the vote. Senator Britt? Aye. 30 having voted in the affirmative and 19 in the negative. Motion to override the governor's veto of Senate Bill 678 passes by three-fifths of the members present and voting in accordance with Article 2, Section 22, Paren 1 of the Constitution of North Carolina, Senate Bill 678, together with the governor's objections and veto message will be sent to the House by special message for reconsideration. Members, upon the motion of Senator Tom McGinnis of Moore County, Chair is happy to extend courtesies of the gallery to Mr. Jim Van Cannon. Uh, Mr. Van Cannon is a member of the Moore County Board of Commissioners and is a retired U.S. Army Special Operations veteran. Uh, Mr. Van Cannon, if you're in the gallery, please stand to be recognized. Thank you. Senate Bill 747, the clerk will read. Senate Bill 747, elections, law changes. Senator Daniel is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Again, we have had lengthy floor debates on this bill on more than one occasion, so I won't belabor this debate by going over the bill's provisions in great detail like Senator Sanderson might do on a reg reform bill. <laughs> But among other changes, the bill would require that absentee ballots, other than military and overseas ballots, be received by the close of the polls on election day. It would prohibit the state board and county boards from accepting private monetary donations for the purpose of administering elections or employing individuals on a temporary basis. The bill would provide that for any individual registering to vote during same-day registration, if the Postal Service returns the, the first mailing of the individual's voter registration card as undeliverable before the end of the business day, uh, before Canvas, the County Board would not register the individual and would ret retrieve the individual's marked ballot and remove the ballot's votes from the official count. It would also provide that the second, a second primary, if requested, would be held 10 weeks after the first primary, regardless of ballot items in the second primary. The bill would require political parties to allow unaffiliated voters to participate in that party's primary. Unaffiliated voters could not participate in more than one primary. Finally, the bill would create a new process for removing voters who are ineligible from the voter rolls, including non-citizens who cannot perform jury service. 
So the intent of this bill is to help lend confidence to vo voters in elections by strengthening the integrity of the process and procedures that control how votes are cast. I understand that there are disagreements between the majority and the minority parties on the best way to accomplish this goal. And unfortunately, the governor and his party continue to use hyper hyperbolic rhetoric about the bill. One of the, th the, the most inaccurate criticisms of the bill is that it will, quote, uh, cause legal ballots to be thrown out. As you know, in any ball game, if you score a touchdown after the, dead, after the clock buzzer sounds, it doesn't count. If you shoot a basket, a three-pointer, after the shot clock has expired, it doesn't count. If you show up at the polls at 731 and want to cast your vote, you're not allowed to do so. We're changing the absentee ballot process slightly to conform with 30 other states who have the election day as the ballot deadline. This will be clearly communicated to everyone who receives an absentee ballot. And every, every legally cast absentee ballot that arrives before 7.30 on election day will be counted. Those will be the legal ballots. But the allegations against the bill are just one more example of why this bill is needed. We must take common sense steps to ensure that our elections are fair and free from perceived bias. And therefore, Mr. President, I move that Senate Bill 747, election law changes become law, notwithstanding the objections of the governor. Discussion or debate? Senator Smith, for what purpose you rise? To debate the motion. You have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, I think first it's important for us to know that this is not a game. So while we're making references to shot clocks and, and touchdowns and, and all of that, this is the people's right to vote. A robust and equitable democratic process is the heartbeat at the center of a just and thriving society. Our democracy serves as the cornerstone of our collective voice. It is the process that brings politics together, and it gives every citizen an equal opportunity to participate in shaping the future of our state. The importance of a fair and free democratic process in North Carolina cannot be overstated. But today, I'm sorry to say, our voting process will become far less fair and free if Senate Bill 747 is enacted. This bill is a monster, and the provisions contained within it should not be taken lightly. Let's start with the changes this bill makes to mail-in ballots, a method of voting that more than 187,000 North Carolinians utilized in 2022. Currently, voters have three days after the elections to submit their mail-in ballots, but Senate Bill 747 will impose a strict deadline of 7.30 on election day. This alteration would disenfranchise over 10,000 voters who may struggle to meet this new shorter deadline. In a state where elections can be decided by a few hundred voters, this will matter. And while my colleagues are bending over backwards to shorten the amount of time that you can turn in your mail-in ballot They've actually extended the amount of time that they can challenge your mail-in ballot and potentially eliminate your vote. Hmm, isn't that funny? We are restricting the people that we're fighting for, but we're expanding our own power. Hmm. Furthermore, voter ID seemingly wasn't enough. So now this bill introduces a pilot program for additional barriers to our constitutional right to vote by requiring signature verification of mail-in ballots. And while we have seen grave questions about the effectiveness and fairness of programs like these, this bill rushes to start signature verification in the next year's election. Additionally, in this Senate Bill 747, there's a section that says, if you made a simple mistake or forget to include a piece of information about a witness who watched you sign your ballot, you can no longer fix that problem and your vote will not count. There's also a provision that allows poll observers 
the freedom to move around within those polling locations to listen to your conversations between you and the election officials. And it even allows them to take pictures of you. Think about that. It's illegal in North Carolina for you to use your cell phone to take a selfie while you're voting. But now we're saying that poll watchers will be able to take as many photos of you as they want while you are voting. There are also provisions that requires voters who do same day registration during the early voting period on a retrievable ballot instead of a usual ballot. And another provision that allows voters to challenge ballots in the entire county as opposed to the current law which only allows them to challenge voters in their precinct. These changes have echoes of the anti-democratic work being done in Georgia, and that has enabled a culture of mass challenges in their elections. And there is no reason to invite this type of mayhem to the state of North Carolina. You know, I hear so often from my colleagues about how important the sanctity of the election process is. But let's be honest and call SB 747 exactly what it is. It is voter intimidation. Again, it is voter intimidation. And this will bring a host of privacy concerns and questions about the base constitutionality of what we're doing here today. We've all heard from our constituents the people of our state have made it clear that they are concerned about elections, but these proposals are not the solutions to what voters are worried about. These are the things that are making people scared. These are the things that makes voters feel like their voice isn't heard and their vote does not count. I urge you all to stand up for our democracy and for the voters of our state who put you here to speak on their behalf. I ask you to vote no on this bill and let's sustain the governor's veto. Thank you. Further discussion or debate? Hearing none, motion before the Senate is that Senate Bill 747 become law notwithstanding the objections of the governor. All in favor will vote aye. All opposed will vote no. Five seconds be allowed for the voting. Clerk, record the vote. Thirty having voted uh, in the affirmative and 19 in the negative, the motion to override the governor's veto of Senate Bill 747 passes by three-fifths of the members present and voting. In accordance with Article 2, Section 22, Paren 1 of the Constitution of North Carolina, Senate Bill 747, together with the governor's objections and veto message, will be sent to the House by special message for reconsideration. Senate Bill 749, the clerk will read. Senate Bill 749, no partisan advantage in elections. Senator Paul Newton is recognized to explain the motion. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, North Carolinians deserve to have confidence in the elections process. That's why you've seen Republicans in the General Assembly focus their efforts on increasing voter confidence. In previous discussions about this bill, and we have had many, unfortunately a recent signal poll found that only 50 percent of North Carolinians think that future elections will be free and fair. As uh, soon as four days ago, another poll was reported by WRAL, and it, uh, it starts by saying, new national polling by Survey USA shows voters across the country are deeply pessimistic about our current political system. It goes on to cite that 84% of registered voters said American democracy is in serious or very serious trouble. That includes nine out of 10 Republicans and independents and three quarters of all Democrats. McLennan says voters who think democracy is in trouble are also likely to doubt institutions like the elections process. It looks bad for 2024, he quotes, in terms of whatever side wins the presidency or whatever race you're looking at, if that's not your candidate, you're going to doubt the outcome. 
And we just believe members, and this is exactly what this bill uh, moves forward, is that voters should have confidence in the outcome of an election regardless of who wins. Mm -hmm. So 749 is an effort to rebuild the trust in our elections. It restructures the State Board of Elections and the County Boards of Elections to ensure that they are truly and literally bipartisan. The bill evenly splits appointments between the majority and minority parties in each chamber. That means the minority leaders, currently Senator Blue and Representative Reeves, have an equal say in appointments. If the chambers were to flip, each party would still have an equal say. This structure does not favor a party, nor does it favor a single elected official. And thus, the inherent fairness should help restore voter confidence. Instead, it allows 170 legislators from Murphy to Manio to work together to appoint the best candidates for the boards of election. Our current board structure allows the party of the governor, whichever party that is, it allows it to manipulate the system. And we saw that actually happen here in North Carolina in 2020. It actually happened. So this is not theoretical. This, this is important to the integrity of our electoral process. The new structure will not allow either party to have control of our elections process. As we look to the 2023 and 2024 elections, it's important for the General Assembly to come together to ensure that our elections administration works on behalf of voters, not a political party or a single elected official, and this bill does just that. It's for that reason, uh, Mr. President, that I move that Senate Bill 749, no partisan advantage in elections, become law, notwithstanding the objections of the governor. Thank you. Discussion or debate. Senator Murdoch, for what purpose you rise? To speak on the motion. You have the floor. Without question, Senate Bill 749 will create chaos and gridlock in our elections, sowing distrust in our democracy. This bill puts legislators and the majority party in control of local boards of elections, making it easier to discount votes and election outcomes. While the bill creates an eight-member board, as was just described, evenly split between the two major parties, the issue is it also requires unanimous decisions or it kicks those decisions to this body, which does not have a great track record of being objective in considering election results. This effort to exert more political control over our elections will create more partisan gridlock and threatens election integrity in North Carolina. With evenly split election boards, we will have less, less security and less certainty in our democratic process. Split election boards mean decisions on early voting sites, recounts, and count candidate eligibility go to the legislative majority, which is the same in both chambers. I'm no sports expert. I guess we got a lot of sport uh, analogies today. Uh, but it sounds like a lot of calling the balls and strikes in your own game. Our current system even provided Governor McCrory with the ability to have a full recount in my county in Durham when he ran for re-election in 2016. The majority has tried for years to take away early voting opportunities under SB 749, a tied decision by county boards on how, where, or how many early, vo early voting sites each county should have will result in reducing the county to one location only. More North Carolinians voted early on, than on election day in 2022. So why will we move forward with this bill that could potentially take away voting opportunities that are based on the needs of our local counties? This bill was never about strengthening our elections. It's about a power grab. Senate Bill 749 is a clear violation of our state's constitution. Legal scholars, lawyers, and even the far right, John Locke Foundation, I think this is the first time in three years I've ever quoted the John Locke Foundation in my speech today, but it was appropriate. Um, and they spoke out against this blatant violation of the separation of powers upheld in our constitution. As stated by the John Locke Foundation in 2016, special session, the state legislator passed legislation modifying the State Board of Elections, moving four of the eight appointments away from the governor and giving them to the 
Speaker of the House and pro tem of the Senate instead. A superior court established that the Board of Elections must be under executive authority and rejected the idea of legislative appointments, citing McCrory v. Berger. The court was correct in ruling against the state legislator as the administration of elections is inherently under the executive branch's authority. And again, this was stated in um, the John Locke Foundation website. Voters have already rejected this partisan power grab by a 61% margin during the 2018 elections. And similar efforts have been blocked by the state Supreme Court time and time again. All living governors. Republicans and Democrats, along with two-thirds of North Carolina voters and the courts, have all rejected this deceptive takeover of our democratic process. Democracy dies in the darkness. So it's our duty to shed light on these anti-democracy bills that are before us today. I urge all of you to sustain Governor Cooper's veto and preserve the will of voters in our state. Further discussion or debate? Hearing none, question for the Senate is that Senate Bill 749 become law notwithstanding the objections of the governor. All in favor will vote aye. All opposed will vote no. Five seconds be allowed for the voting. Clerk, record the vote. Thirty having voted in the affirmative, nineteen in the negative. The motion to override the governor's veto of Senate Bill 749 passes by three-fifths of the members present in voting in accordance with Article 2, Section 22, Paren 1 of the Constitution of North Carolina, Senate Bill 749, together with the governor's objections and veto message, will be sent to the House by special message for reconsideration. Message from the House. Clerk will read. Mr. President, it is ordered that a message be sent to the Senate informing the honorable body that the House of Representatives has passed House Bill 600 ratified and account an act to provide further regulatory relief to the citizens of North Carolina, notwithstanding the objections of the governor. Pursuant to Article 2, Section 22 of the North Carolina Constitution, the bill, together with the objections and the veto message, are hereby delivered to your honorable body for consideration. Respectfully, James White, Principal Clerk. Governor Roy Cooper objections and veto message, House Bill 600, an act to provide further regulatory relief to the citizens of North Carolina. This bill is a hodgepodge of bad provisions that will result in dirtier water, discriminatory permitting, and threats to North Carolina's environment. It also undoes a significant sea policy to promote fairness in state contracting for his historically underutilized businesses as it blocks efforts to encourage diverse suppliers for state purchases, rules that would save taxpayer dollars and help businesses grow. The rules minor the successful approach used for 18 years in state construction contracts, and they were enacted with extensive feedback from the state agencies and vendors that they were approved by the Rules Review Commission, which has all of its members appointed by the Republican-controlled legislature. Therefore, I veto the bill. Roy Cooper, Governor. Mr. President, for what purpose your eyes? A motion, please. State your motion. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, um, House Bill 600, Reg Reform of 2023, has come over from the House and been read in by the reading clerk. Move that be added to today's full calendar. So ordered.
House Bill 600, clerk will read. House Bill 600, Regulatory Reform Act of 2023. Senator Sanderson is recognized to explain the motion. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Members of the Senate, I think this is about the fourth time that we've seen this piece of legislation come through the Senate. Uh, maybe it'll be the last time for this year. You've already heard some of the things that uh, House Bill 600 does, uh, Re Regulatory Reform Act of 2023. Uh, it provides critical regulatory relief to the citizens, the business community, manufacturers, farmers, state agencies, and brings better protections for our coastal communities. It includes stormwater program changes which remove discrepancies and encourages redevelopment. It reforms the dated wastewater peak daily flow right rates that are stifling needed workforce housing supply and economic development in North Carolina. It has new procedural requirements for the Coastal Area Management Program to increase transparency. It modifies the riparian buffer and floodplain rules for airports to encourage investment and expansion in our world-class airport infrastructures. It allows developers working in the Brownfields Development Program to perform inspections and investigations without approval from the state to speed up redevelopment. It gives the Commissioner of Agriculture the authority to implement any emergency measure and procedures needed to mitigate an imminent threat to or a disruption of the agriculture supply chain. It protects our coastal communities by phasing out unencapsulated polystyrene restoring the 2009 building codes for docks and piers, prohibiting certain dredging moratoriums, and implementing a new fish harvest reporting system. And I just wanted to say, uh, finally, that uh, uh, to my understanding, everything that has to do with the environment uh, has been uh, worked out with DEQ, and uh, I don't know of a single thing that they're not on board with us in the language that we have put in this bill. So, Mr. President, I move that House Bill 600, Regulatory Reform Act of 2023, become law, notwithstanding the objections of the governor. Discussion or debate? Senator Robinson, for what purpose arise? To debate uh, the report, the conference report, and the motion. Uh, Senator Robinson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Sanderson and I talked earlier about this section of House Bill 600. And so I want to stand to give some clarifications to this discussion. Some of you think you're giving handouts to women and minorities through the HUB program. So we talked about this, Senator Sanderson, and you admitted that you were not aware of this being in the bill. So let me, let me talk about this a little bit. There's an erroneous assumption that there's a quota system in North Carolina. The correction is that you're simply, as a, as a state, providing equity and opportunity so businesses, white business owners who, and minorities of all races have an equal opportunity to bid for contracts. These businesses receive certification and training so that they can be a part of the state procurement effort. I was recently speaker for the Carolinas Association of General Contractors that graduated 25 minority and women-owned businesses that were trained and certified to do business in our state. North Carolina is home to over 8,000 certified hub businesses as historically underutilized businesses. These businesses include black, Native American, Asian, Hispanic, and women, which are white, mostly women-owned businesses. Over the years, because of these good faith efforts, there has been success in hub businesses winning contracts in our state. 
This is because of statutory efforts made to include all businesses in the supply chain. In 2022, the state spent a total of $10 billion in goods and services, with over only $645 million spent with hub firms. Much of the hub spend is with women-owned businesses. The good faith efforts do not guarantee any business a contract. The efforts only allow all businesses, regardless of their ethnicity or gender, to participate in the supply chain. The state awards contracts based on the lowest bid, and nothing will change with the procurement process. Consideration should be made to include good faith efforts, language, to, to ensure that all businesses in North Carolina have a fair opportunity to participate. And Senator Sanderson, you said to, to Senator Murdoch and to me on this floor that you would seek some technical corrections in some bill to rectify this language. I, I repeat again to all of you, this is 20, 18 years that this state has made a good faith effort to make sure that small businesses, all of these races of people and white women who have not had an equal opportunity to bid for businesses, that they have a fair chance. So I'm going to hold you to that commitment on this floor, Senator Sanderson, and hope that Senator Jackson is going to help you, Senator Jackson, because we worked on this for years. Thank you, Mr. President. Further discussion or debate? Senator Sanderson, for what purpose you rise? Uh, to speak to the motion a second yeah. time. Uh, uh, this would be your first time. First time. Was an explanation. Uh, Senator Sanderson is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Robinson, we had, did have that conversation, and I assured you that we would look into that in the short session to try to find some remedy to this problem. This has nothing to do with this chamber trying to eliminate the hub program. Absolutely nothing. This was brought to us by another division, a Department of State Government, that because the Department of Administration, which is supposed to be administering this program, is pushing a lot of their workload onto other departments, they don't have the man, manpower to, to keep up. And so I told you what we would do is, and it's, to my knowledge, the Department of Administration never came to any appropriations committee in this chamber and requested more money so they could hire more people to do the job. And so we will take a look at it. But this is only because state agencies have come to us and said we cannot do the workload that is being pushed down the pipeline to us. And so that's what we need to work on to get the proper amount of people in the proper places so that they will be able to do the job that the Department of Administration is tasked with doing. So thank you. Further discussion or debate? Senator Robinson, for what purpose you rise? Speak to the motion a second time. Um, it is a motion, I believe, the rules. I know I'm supposed oh. to do just one, Mr. President, but I know that you're good about allowing just a little exception. <laughs> and just to ask, just to. Uh, but, but see, Senator Robinson, if I, if I say yes to you, then. Well, just a question to the, to the bill sponsor, Mr. President, just to clear it up for you. I tell you what, um, I'll, I'll let you speak, but um, let's, let's go ahead and move along. Okay, I'm going to make it quick. Senator Sanderson, just this morning I did talk to Department of Administration, and they do need the funds. However, they are supportive of keeping this language in the statutes. So I just want to clarify that for you. Thank you, Mr. President, for your leniency. Further discussion or debate? Hearing none, question for the Senate is that House Bill 600 become law notwithstanding the objections of the governor. All in favor would vote aye. All opposed would vote no. Five seconds be allowed for the voting clerk to record the vote.
Senator Lowe, no. 30 having voted in the affirmative, 18 in the negative. Motion to override the governor's veto of House Bill 600 passes by three-fifths of the members present and voting in accordance with Article 2, Section 22, Paren 1 of the, North Carolina, of the Constitution of North Carolina, House Bill 600 becomes law notwithstanding the objections of the governor at 1.22 p.m. The House will be so notified. Members, I believe that completes our calendar. Are there any notices or announcements? Senator Alexander, for what purpose you rise? Uh, to offer a senatorial statement.